morning we continue in our study of James chapter 2. We continue in our study of James chapter 2. There's a Christian psychologist, uh, excuse me, not a Christian psychologist, a Jewish psychologist in the history of psychology named Alfred Adler. He was born in 1870 in Europe and um, he died in 1937. Um, as the Nazi regime was coming to power in Austria, he fled for his life because he was from a Jewish ancestry. In fact, he came to Long Island, New York, and went to work as a medical doctor as well as a psychiatrist and psychologist um, there in Long Island at the Long Island School of Medicine. He had traveled back to Europe to speak in Ireland and suddenly died of a heart attack that was there as he was there um, visiting. He was, a, he was a groundbreaking psychologist in the area of individual psychology. And um, he was not a believer, he was not a Christian, but he said this, he really found something in his study of psychology that is a very biblical principle and I want you to see what it is. He said, trust only in movement. Life begins, excuse me, life happens at the level of action. We are not what we say, but we are what we do. What we do is the real indicator of our intentions. Now, though a secular psychologist he nailed James chapter 2. He understood that we can say things. He understood that we can proclaim to believe things. But what we wind up doing is what reveals what we really believe and who we really are. James is very concerned about that. And so as James Wright, Pastor James, for those of you that are new to us this morning or have been away for a little bit, we're studying this little book of James. Hopefully you have your Bible. Go ahead and turn with me to James chapter 1 and James chapter 2. In James chapter 1, we see these tests that Pastor James is laying out for Jewish Christians to determine whether their faith is real. He's very concerned that they're self-deceived. He's very concerned that they're religious, but they don't truly have a relationship with God that honors God. You see, religion is very prevalent in practically every age of humanity and in practically every place in humanity. Even in secular, secular, secularism, we tend to show religious fervor and faith in various ideologies. Here we see that James is saying, do you really have faith in God, faith that saves? You see, what we do proves who we are and what we believe. Let's look at James chapter 2 and verse 14, and I want us to read this passage again. It is good that we allow our eyes to carefully take in um, this Word of God as we've studied it now for the fourth week. Let's look at James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? And I've underlined this for you. Can that faith save him? Circle the word save. You see, this isn't a peripheral issue. This is a key issue this morning. As we look at this, James isn't just talking about a nice faith that's an additive to your life or something that can help you be happier or something along those lines, help you make it through difficult times. James is talking about a faith that saves your soul from God's judgment. He's talking about a faith that rescues you and rescues me from our sin. So he says, can that faith save him? Verse 15, if a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, 
without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Underline that. What good is that? He's calling into question this thing that you say that you have faith, but you can turn away from a brother in need. Verse 17, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith, what? By my works. Circle the word by. I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, the Shema, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. The word shudder there means it, it has to do with bristling. It's the actual the Greek word for bristling. You, you, you see a, a, a dog or a cat or some animal that comes along and they come across another animal. I was down in the Keys yesterday and in the middle of the night I heard two cats fighting out there in the neighborhood. And I mean, have you, have you, have you ever heard that before? It is the most horrible sound. It, it brings new understanding to this cat fight that we've seen in our nation recently. But they're, they're out there fighting, and I, and I have this visual, I'm laying there in bed, and I have this visual image of these two cats just bowed up, their hair standing up, they're bristling, and they're, they're bristling kind of in fear, they're afraid, but they've got to fight. They're, one is a little bolder than the other, but they're, they're bristling with anxiety and, and, and anger and fear. And that is the picture of what the demons do. You see, the demons know that God is three in one. The demons know that God, who God is. The demons believe in the virgin birth. The demons believe in the miracles. The demons have all the right theology. And it's because they know who God is and they know who they are and they know what is coming, they shudder in fear. James is saying even the demons believe the right things, but they know what is coming. Do you? Verse 20. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is what? useless. Verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Verse 22, you see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. Faith was completed by his verse, works. Verse 23, and the scripture was counted to him, excuse me, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Whoa. We're going to look at that a little bit more today. What happened to the five solas, right? Okay, we're going to see that. Verse 25. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is what? Dead. Is dead. James is in a titanic swordplay over a false theology. James sees that a wrong mentality has made its way into the church, and James is fighting that as a pastor for all he's worth. He is seeking to bring out to us these tests, tests of what do we do with trials? Do we trust in God or do we run in fear? Do we really have faith that sees us through the trials of this life? What about when temptations come? Do we blame that on God? These are from James chapter 1. What about the issue of receiving the word? Do you receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls? 
James is calling us to look at the issue of partiality. You remember we studied for, for several weeks just the prior verses in James chapter 2 saying that, that you have partiality in your heart because there's someone that's not like you and you call yourself a Christian? There is no partiality with God and if you are partial, you, you are not with God. You see, he is, he is bringing up hard things, and now he brings up this issue of a dead faith, a faith that has nothing to show for it. And he is, he is very concerned that we can even come to church, we can even follow Pastor Fred's lead and take out our wallet, and we can even sacrificially give. I mean, the online. I mean, we, we give sacrifice. We can do all of these things, and yet if our heart is not transformed before God, that we are dead in our sins. Notice at the bottom of the page, there's three things, three problems from last week, and this is just by way of review. There's the pro problematic claim, the claim that you have faith. This person says, I have faith. But he has no works. That's a problematic claim. There are, last week we said there are many people who claim to be Christians. There are many people who claim to believe in Christ. But James is saying, while there's many who proclaim that, are there many who truly have that and have him? You see, there's a problematic understanding of faith. We looked at several different types of faith last week. Do you remember that? We looked at the intellectual ascent. We looked at the fact that I believe intellectually the facts. I believe that Jesus was God. I believe that he came into the earth. I believe that he lived a sinless life. I believe that he preached the gospel of God, who God really was. I believe that he went to the cross. I even believe that he rose from the dead. But there's, a, there's an intellectual agreement that can be there without a heart and a life that is engaged with that. There's a great danger in that. And so there are some who, they, they don't know all of those details, but they have feelings. Marcy said, I thought you were going to do the feelings, nothing more than feelings. I mean, that's the culture that we live in today. We're not so concerned, but don't bother me with the facts. Just let me feel good. I feel that, I feel that, I feel, we, we rarely say, I think that, or I believe that. We talk about feelings. And there's many who have done that with God, and, and if things, if you feel spiritual, then you must be spiritual. If you don't feel very spiritual, then, then things must be off with God. And we talked about several other aspects of a misunderstood faith and trust in God. So there's the problematic understanding that we see here in this passage. This person says, I have faith, but he, he, doesn't, he doesn't have anything to show for it. Look at the next part here. There's the problematic absence of works. The proof is not in the pudding in this case. There, there, there's no proof there. And so we recognize that faith, what he's saying here, and fill this in, faith without works is what kind of faith? It's a dead faith. It's not that it's non-existent. No, it's there, but it is, it is useless, as he says in verse 20. It is a dead faith that is getting you nowhere. In verse 17, he's calling this dead in itself. And in verse 14, he's saying, can this faith save you? And the, the answer to that is no. You remember with me that there are six rhetorical questions in this passage. He's asking questions to make points. Didn't Jesus do that a lot? That's a very, that's a very fine way of Hellenistic argument that's um, the, the whole Greek influence upon the, the New Testament is this Hellenistic Jewish argument. And very often, I mean, we see that in the life of Jesus. Very often, Jesus made some of his clearest and most poignant points by asking questions. And we see that six times here. Is this faith a real faith? Is it a saving faith? Is it useless to you? So, 
This morning, I want us to see that there, there's this very stark comparison. There are two kinds of faith, and we really need to understand this. There is a saving faith. There is a saving faith that God offers to us, that God gives to us, that God brings to us, that redeems us from our sin. There is a saving faith that rescues us. It is the, the idea of full-on rescue. But there is also the idea seen throughout Scripture of a non-saving faith. It is possible to have a faith that you hold to that will not save you. And this is throughout the New Testament. It is, in fact, throughout the Old Testament. We want to look for just a few minutes, especially in the teachings of Jesus. And this, this morning, I, I just invite you to look at the screen some as we go through these. Do you see these passages? Some of you already flipped the sheet. Shame on you. Look at all of these verses down here. <laughs> these verses mean something. I want you to see these, and I'm going to put them on the screen. You, want to make, you may want to make some notes off to the side. I know there's not room, much room there. That's what we get for half sheets, by the way, as opposed to full sheets. But notice here in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7, and, and, and the idea is that John the Baptist is preaching, preparing the way for Christ. This is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. John the Baptist has huge followings following him and listening to him proclaim the, the way of the Messiah, that the fact that the Messiah has come, he is called the forerunner of Christ, and he was such a powerful preacher that people were even leaving Jerusalem to go listen to him out in the wilderness. And he was baptizing people, helping them turn from their sin and turn, declaring that the kingdom of God has come in Christ. And notice what he says, but when he saw, Matthew tells us, but when he, that's John the Baptist, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Look at verse 8. Bear fruit in keeping with what? Repentance. You see, the crowds were coming. There were many who were coming. Even the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were watching it and getting in on it. And, and John the Baptist, as the word was beginning to be proclaimed that God is holy and you are not and you need a Messiah, the Pharisees were seeking to come in in their religious way and be part of the action. But John knew that their hearts were not repenting toward God. And he declared to them, you are to bear fruit. This is works. You are to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Have you turned to God? That's what repentance means. Have you turned to God? This is an action. This isn't simply coming and sitting and listening to my nice sermons and hearing nice music and, and enjoying good fellowship. It is... It, it is more than that. It is, it is this thing that our life has been turned to God. And so notice here, not only in Matthew chapter 3, but in Matthew chapter 5, it is Jesus' inaugural sermon. This is the Sermon on the Mount. This, here Jesus is laying it out. Look at verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Verse 15. Nor do you light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Now look at verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your what? Your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Notice that. That Jesus is assuming that we are changed by his story and his truth and his action on our behalf. And that our faith brings about a changed life. Jesus is assuming good works. Look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. It's not the sayers, but the doers. In verse 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But look what he says. 
But the one who does what? Does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Do you see that, that works are very, very much a part of our salvation? James is saying if there are no works, there is no indication of salvation. There is no indication of saving faith. He's very serious about this issue. Look at the next. John. So now we switch gears over to John, where we've studied for a few years already in our church. In John 23, we see Christ's own example of good works. In verse 23, he says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. It is the works that he was doing. He was saying, I am the Messiah, and he's showing them, I am the Messiah. He is saying to them, I am God, I have power over sin, I am God, I, I have power over death, and he is healing the sick, he is, he is coming, and he is raising the dead, and people are amazed because Jesus is doing works in keeping with what he is saying. We see it in the life of Jesus. In John chapter 3, a Pharisee Nicodemus comes to Jesus. And you remember that. He's a, he's a Pharisee, and he comes to Jesus as not, at night. This is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And the Pharisees have been listening to what Jesus has been saying. They've been listening to his teaching. And Nicodemus is, I mean, he's a high up Pharisee, and he's wondering, what does he mean by that? How is it that that we come to God and that we are born again. How is it that he makes us new? Do we, you remember he came and he asked Jesus, are we to enter back into our mother's womb? I mean, how does it, and Jesus just said, Nicodemus, are you a teacher of the law and you don't understand what I'm saying? That when a, when a man or a woman repents of their sin and places their trust in God, there is a transformation that takes place. And that you go from being one creature to being a new creature because God has rescued you from your sin. You're born again. It's not just Jimmy Carter who said, well, I'm a Christian, I'm born again. I mean, it, it, it's more than that. I mean, it, it's more than a popular phrase. It is, a, it is a true symbol of what God has called us to experience. Look what he says in John chapter 3, verse 1. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, look what I've highlighted. We know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, at this point, let me just tell you that they confessed that they believed that Jesus was from God, but they had not yet been transformed. You see, there, we, you remember when we studied the book of John? You remember as we've looked in the book of Matthew and in Luke? There are many who believed that it says over and over again, they believed. They saw it. And they believed that Jesus was doing these acts. They believed that Jesus was doing these things. But then they would leave him and they would not follow him. Or they would come back to him and condemn him. That's what many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees did. So there is such thing as a faith that is not a saving faith. Nicodemus and his Pharisee friends believed to Jesus in a degree, in an intellectual assent of who he was, but not in a transformative way that would come in faith of repentance of sin toward God. John 8, 31 is very similar clarifies this point even more. Notice with me on the, on, excuse me, not on the outline, but on the screen in front of you. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Here we see it again. Verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Just, just notice those words that are there. Jesus said, it's not because of your pedigree. 
It is not because you are Jews that you're going to be free. You see, that was the assumption in their day and time. When Jesus began his ministry, they already thought, well, we've got it together, and the rest of the world's pagans, and they're lost, and they're going to hell. We are the people who have the truth. And Jesus showed up saying, oh, you have the truth. You have the faith, but you're lost as a ball in high weeds. You have not truly come to faith in God. You're very religious, but you don't know God. You see, Jesus came with that message. And, you know, we need to hear that today. We, we are prone to this. Before we get all negative on the Jewish first century people, we need to understand that there are many Protestant believers and there are many Catholic believers and there are many churchgoers in America who have never had a transforming submission to Christ. Notice here with me the word if. Jesus said this, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. The word abide means to remain, to stay with. If you stay in my word, you are my disciples. If you remain with me, you are my disciples. But if, what's the other inference here? If you don't abide in my word, if you don't remain with me, you are not my disciples. Look at verse 34. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Verse 35, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. Verse 36, so if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. That doesn't sound like they're saved, does it? They're seeking to kill the Messiah. Jesus said, you hear my words, you say that you believe them, but even right now some of you are thinking about how to entrap me and kill me. You're rejecting me. You see, notice what he says in verse 38. I speak of what I have seen from my Father, and you do what you have heard from your Father. The next verse declares who their Father is, and who is their Father? The devil, devil, Satan. See, so works have to do with that. If we have not been transformed to the kingdom of light by faith in Christ and, and transformed from a life devoted to sin and self to a life devoted to God in faith in God, then we will do the things of this life and we will not do the things of the Father. There is saving faith and there is non-saving faith. There are two types of faith and it is very, very concerning that we would look at that. In fact, Jesus goes on and on and on on this point. Think about Matthew chapter 13. For those of you who know that, um, just think about that, the four soils. How many of those soils was, was good soil? One. The other three wound up with a lost harvest. The other three wound up in death. One trampled underfoot, one springs up and then dies out because of the, the rocks that are around it. No, no, no. One springs up, but the weeds come and choke it out. You see, Jesus is, is bringing home. There's the wheat and the tares. What is a wheat and a tare? A wheat and a tare is that there are, there's a weed that looks like wheat. And so it grows up in the field, and it all looks like wheat. But you don't know until harvest what is wheat and what is weed. Not talking about marijuana. What is, what is <laughs> mauvais herb for the French speakers, the, 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 the weeds. Sorry, my middle school mind sometimes is so distracting, and I'm... If you guys only knew what I hold back, I mean, but, sorry. But the wheat and the tares is a very serious issue. And you don't know the difference until harvest time when it's supposed to be doing what? 
bearing fruit. Can you say bearing fruit? fruit. It's supposed to be bearing fruit. And when it doesn't bear fruit, then it indicates that this is simply a stray plant. It is not real. So there's the four soils and the wheat and the tare. And then think about John 15 with me. John 15 is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. It is, it is a, a beautiful passage. There's beautiful promises in it, but there's also stark warnings. And the stark warnings are that if, if you're a branch that doesn't bear fruit, that has no fruit, it is cut off and thrown into the fire. You see, Jesus is serious about our faith producing works. Jesus is serious about our faith being visible and seen and being productive. And when when we don't bear fruit, when we are living in ourselves, when we are continuing in our sin, and our lives have not been transformed, Jesus and James are saying the same thing, that you are lost in your sin. So, now, just flip your sheet over. It's safe. You're not going to be condemned. Um, look, at the, look at the next part here. Remember James chapter 1, and maybe you have your Bible open to James, and you can see over there in James chapter 1 that we've already seen this issue of faith come up already. James is, has been bringing it up in chapter 1, Look at verse 22. Look at James chapter 1 and verse 22. But be doers of the word and not what? Hearers only. And what do those hearers only do? Deceiving themselves. Ooh. That's really important. You see, we deceive ourselves. We're not even deceived by somebody else. We're deceiving ourselves. If we say that we know God, love God, but do not do the things that he says. Notice what he says in verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers, only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For when he looks at himself and, has, and goes away and at once forgets what he is like. Verse 25. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, so he's doing, being no hearer who forgets, but a, oh man, I almost want to say underline it, but many of you have pew Bibles in your hands, so don't, but but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So there is this picture with God that action really matters. God didn't just tell us that he loves us. God, in the, in the form of a man, comes, second person of the Trinity, Jesus of Nazareth. And he comes and he lives in this life, in this fallen world. He tells us what the truth is. We reject it. He continues to love us. And he says, as he's being hung up on the cross, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. This is love, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. You see, all these are actions. They're not just happy thoughts. They're not just spiritual feelings. They're not chills that run down your your spine and your skin. They're, They're far more than that. They're not little religious acts that you do to make deals with God. It's that our faith is real, that we've been transformed, and we live it. So James chapter 1 says it, but then we see these beautiful other passages that have brought a a great question to many of our minds. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace, circle the word grace on your outline, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is, underline it, not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Underline it again, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
James is, we're going to see in James chapter 4, he deals with boasting. James doesn't want to boast. In fact, that's even why he words part of what he words in our, our main scripture here, that he's saying, you say this, and I say this, and, and you know, he's not saying, I, I, I am this way, so much as he's saying, do you really have faith that shows Galatians 2.16 is another passage that we must look at in the course of James chapter 2. Look at verse 16 right there on your outline. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Twice he says that, not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one can be justified. Now, that, that, that appears to be a direct contradiction. Paul in Ephesians, Paul in Galatians, seems to be directly contradicting what James is saying. But this is why it is so important that we study the background, we study the full picture, we study the context of what James is saying. Nowhere is James declaring that you can save yourself. Instead, I want you to see this and fill it in. James is not saying that we are saved by works. But no one is saved without producing works. He is, he is battling this because he wants them to see something. Now, this next diagram on your outline with the arrow, I think, may really help you understand where, where James is coming from. Think about this. For the Jewish Christians that James is writing to, there's two extremes. First of all, there is the extreme that they came from, which is all works and no grace. Put underneath that OT, the Old Testament. That was what they had come to. They did not see. They did not understand. Of course, there was God's grace in the Old Testament. God is a gracious God throughout the Old Testament. Anyone who tells you otherwise patently does not understand the Old Testament. God was a God of grace and is a God of grace in the Old Testament. But what had, what had come down in the people's life, and as they, as they got further and further from God as a Jewish nation, it had turned into all works and no understanding of grace through the Messiah or grace by God's presence in a day-by-day -day experience. So they came from religious leaders saying to them, you better, you better, you better, you better. And there was no grace. In fact, there was burdens that were too, too great for the people to bear. And that's why so many of them were downcast and discouraged. And Jesus, when he would look at that and he would see the crowds, they were downcast because the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the rabbis, they, they had simply laid a burden on the people that there was no way that they could bear. And when Jesus saw the people coming, he was brokenhearted for them. Here the Messiah showed up and sees the flock in great pain and difficulty. And so we see that it went from all wakes, works in no grace to in the New Testament era, there were some who exploited the gospel and they went to all grace and no works. Don't we have the same problem today? There are certain churches, there are certain religious movements that it's all law, it's all works, and there's no grace. You have to earn your way to heaven. And then you go to the other ones, and it's just, oh, we love to talk about libertarian grace that just, you know, you, you don't need to be saved. You already are saved. You, you, you already are acting like a Christian. It, it, it is just, it's just down within you, and that's, it's already there. And there's a rejection of the call to actively come to God in faith and obedience. So no one is saved by works, and no one is saved without producing works. It is not about all grace, I mean, all works and no grace, or all grace and no works. James is dealing with those two extremes. 
He's dealing with people in the churches that say, yep, Jesus came, he died, he ascended to heaven, I've heard the whole story, and now we're here to have a good time and just be in our synagogue together, and they remain unchanged, they remain partial towards some, and rejection, rejecting of others. They see people in need, they're not, they're not moved by that. They've got life all figured out. We're going to see that they plan on going to one city and engaging in business and make a profit and not really caring about what God says. James says later in James 3 and 4, he's saying, don't say that you'll go to a city, engage in business, and make a profit. You say, if the Lord wills. You, you live in interaction with God. So James is calling to a very serious calling of faith. Now, we see here in these, in these verses, and very quickly, number one, there's a dead faith it is identified by an empty confession. It's an empty confession. It's somebody who makes a confession, but it's, it's empty. It's someone who says that they have faith, but they have no works. Now, underneath that number one, there's a little phrase here where it says, James and Paul, and I want you to see this. When we compare the writings of Paul and the writings of James, we would, be con we would be tempted to think that they're in conflict, but they're not. Notice this. James and Paul are not, are not standing face to face arguing about the gospel. It's not like Pastor James is saying, no, you're saved by works and you're only saved by works and I'm telling you that it, you, you better have works because if you don't have works then, then there's no hope for you and you need to put your faith in your works and you need to prove in this way and, and by your works you are going to uh, procure heaven by your works. J James is not saying that. James is not opposing Paul face to face. Instead, think of it this way. But rather, Paul and James are back-to-back -back defending the gospel. You think of two guys that are on the same team, and they're being surrounded. They're being surrounded by other warriors that are coming after them. And one guy has got his back, he feels the other guy behind him, and they are battling it out for survival. They are battling it out to make it. And that is the picture that James is saying, look, folks, it's not just... Do whatever you want. You don't, you don't need any works. You, you, you don't, I mean, your faith is simply a feeling. Your faith is simply an intellectual ascent. James is saying, you, you may be a wheat, I mean, excuse me, you may be a tear. You may be part of the rocky soil. You may be the weed soil. And Paul is on the other side saying, dear brothers, listen that God saves us by His grace. He moves in us. We cannot earn His righteousness. He pours down on us His grace and His love and His forgiveness. And you can do nothing in order to earn it. And you mix both of these together and you see a very high view of God's grace and God's calling for transformation. And you see a very high view of proof of that grace that God calls us and he, and he calls us to really look at ourselves and calls us to really look at our lives and say, do I, do I live as a Christian should live? Because there's not only an empty confession, but number two, there's also dead faith is identified by a false compassion. The whole point here is that works do matter. They reveal whether or not there is saving faith. Look at verse 15. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in food, and, some, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? You see, we can, we can have a false compassion. We can have a compassion that's fake. As Pastor Ben said a few weeks ago, our faith calls us to sacrifice. Our faith calls us to risk. Our faith calls us to self-denial because this is the way of the Master. This is the way of Christ. This is what Jesus did. Look at the Lord's Supper. This is what Jesus did. How, how do we think that we would be any different? 
You say, well, I'm not perfect. I can't die for the sins of the world. You don't need to. He already did that. You just die to self and follow him. And he's saying, the proof is in the way you live your life. That's James's big point. Number three, dead faith is identified by shallow conviction. The faith doesn't go very deep. There's not, there's not very much of a, con, a conviction about who God is and, and who we are not. Look what he says in verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. James is saying that works reveal. And this is the issue, and we see it here. James is not declaring that you are going to save yourself. Look at verse 18. James is declaring, I will show you my faith by my work. So he's saying, I will show you that I really believe. And it's going to be that I obey Jesus. And Jesus kept saying this. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? Now, how do we apply this to our lives? Just for a moment, I want you to think about this. Who has more influence over what you believe is right or wrong? Popular culture around you? CNN, Fox News, MSNBC? All of the pop stars from Hollywood? All of the pop stars in music? All of the films and all of the things that are there? Or even maybe decrees and de declarations in your job, maybe decrees and declarations from even our Supreme Court, do those have greater sway over what you believe is right or wrong than God and His Word and what He said in His Word? You see, this is, this is one way we know that we are either of God or of the world is that we believe what he has said, and we do what he has said. And it's a deep conviction. It's a conviction that goes beyond the pressures of this earthly life that we are so prone to see. You see, we can believe for the wrong reasons without very much conviction. Do you have your Bible? Turn with me over to Acts chapter 8. You have to see this. This is beautiful. It's a Yes, it's a chilling example of this. Acts chapter 8. Philip is preaching throughout Samaria. At this point, Saul, the apostle Paul, isn't converted yet. Saul is, in fact, ravaging the church. He is persecuting the church. And a guy named Philip is preaching in Samaria. Look with me in verse 4. I mean, lots of people are coming to faith. Lots of people are being saved. Um, look what it says in verse 4. Um, Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs he did. Verse 7. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were with them, and many were paralyzed or lame, were healed. Verse 8, so there was much joy in that city. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus coming and the power of his spirit, Philip preaching the word, and the, the Holy Spirit giving Philip special strength and power to show that his message was real, and people's very real needs were being met. Look at verse 9. But there was a, name, a man named Simon who had previously practiced what? Magic or sorcery in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him for the least, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. Wow. Be careful. Verse 11, and they paid attention to him, to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip 
as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. That's a significant phrase, both men and women. In this society, it would have been very easy for, for it to simply be men, but we see God's esteem of women. Verse 13, even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip, so the magician gets saved. So it appears. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. So even Simon is amazed, the magician. Look at verse 14. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 17. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Spirit. So he offers to buy the Spirit of God. Verse 20, but Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you. May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Now, you guys, Simon had believed and had been baptized. But his conviction was very shallow. And it was revealed that when other things came along and when he saw his flesh just raises up again and he wants this for himself, Look at verse 22. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. That means he is not saved. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now, friends... We are called to be people of deep conviction that doesn't seek to exploit God for our own purposes and our own joys and our own things. We have come to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords in obedience is unto him as one who has given his life for us. Here's the key concept this morning. Fill it in. Faith alone saves James is not saying that you can work your way to heaven. But faith that saves is never alone. That's what James is saying. Faith alone saves, but faith that saves is never alone. Your life will be characterized by the transforming power of Christ if indeed you have truly been redeemed. So here's the key question. Is my faith visible? Is it showable? I mean, in verse 18, it says it right there. I will show you my faith by my works. You see, if you look at your life and you say, if I'm really honest in my heart of hearts, I just do this and it doesn't really mean anything to me. I, sacrifice is not a part of my life. Service to God and service to others is really not a part of my life. I, I like coming to church because I like the nice positive message. I mean, this doesn't sound very positive if you're not saved. Friends, our God calls us to be people who obey Him. And listen to this. By the power of His Spirit, He gives us the strength to obey. 
You cannot do this on your own strength. But in running to Christ, you and I can obey.